list off all these names on our prayer list, Lord. We just know that you you know each situation, you know the needs. Uh, just pray that you would, uh, just, your will would be done in each situation. We uh, thank you for uh, this church, Lord, and what it means to us. We just pray that uh, we would uh, uh, just keep you first in all of our worship and all that we do. Just that you would just continue to bless us and just use us in your service. It's all in your name we ask. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, today we have another meeting with DBS and small after small groups. Remember, is it next Sunday we're going? Is it five K? <laughs> next Sunday is five K, so we're gonna have church next Sunday afternoon. Uh, next Sunday we have Dwayne West coming, then March nineteenth will be Andrew Johnson, and the twenty sixth will be Chase Rogers, and then Easter Sunday will be Tony Cooper. Have any more announcements? Oh yeah, we have road cleanup on the 18th. Yeah. Don't forget the 18th. Maybe it'll dry out some. We can go another week or two without some rain. Maybe it'll dry out a little bit. Um, sign up sheet is the sign up tables moved over there since we had the cross up for the Easter season. So sign up sheet is over there for um, the 5K if you can help with that, and then um, also for uh, our fellowships that we have coming up. On Wednesday nights, we also still have Mr. Hambright doing a Wednesday night service. And this Wednesday night, we'll have our weekly prayer service for Georgia Ministry Missions starting at 6 30. Three more announcements. I do have a card to read. It says, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing, Genesis 12, 2. May you receive abundant blessings in return for his for the special way you expressed his love. Thank you. Stephen, I want to thank everyone for your thoughts and prayers. We felt each and every one. We are so blessed to have so many friends and family to be there to hold us up and know God is in control, and he is the healer. Thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. Love, Debbie and Steve. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you. They see him here. They see him here. <clears throat> and they see him here. We know him because he said it. Jesus said, the world will see him when the world sees us. That's why together we do this. We give so that those who've not yet seen can see. It means something when the world sees how we give. It means something because we do not look the same. It means something because we do not sound the same. It means something because when we give, this is what the world sees. They see the gospel doing what the world cannot. They see the gospel making us one. And so, we give. We give so that missionaries can go. We give so that churches can be started, hurts can be healed, and truth can be shared. We give so the world might see Jesus in us. United as one.
join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. Oh, with one voice, a thousand generations, sing worthy is the land. have done here lately, they said, Brother John, when I die, will you do my funeral? And I said, well, can we wait a long time to do this? And I said, oh, oh yeah, I can. And she said, but before I, I ask you and get a reply, she said, it's going to be most unusual. And I said, why is that? And she said, because I want all female pallbearers. <laughs> And I said, really? She said, yes, if men are not going to take me out while I'm living, they're not going to take me out while I'm dead. <laughs> but I've noticed that's all changed now. So I'm not going to argue with her being here. I just praise the Lord and very excited. I've known Corey since she was a little bitty, bitty thing, and I've been watching her life. And such a wonderful thrill to see people. Uh, as they serve the Lord and they're excited about doing Amen. so. And it's such Amen. a thrill to be here with you today. And I encourage you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. It's going to be on the screen, and we're, we're going to look at that in just a little bit. To tell you a little bit about where I've been, I've been in ministry now for over half of a century. Last Easter, I had 50 years in ministry. It's 50 plus now. And for 40 of those years, I have been in full-time pastoring, pastoring seven churches. And since retirement, I've done nine interims, believe it or not. I've pastored, I've preached revivals, done evangelistic crusades, I've been guest speakers at banquets. I've preached and I've taught on mission fields, and I've seen every kind of church that you can ever imagine. Uh, big churches, small churches, some that are ornate and some that are just like huts. Some that are enclosed and some that are in the open air. Some that have large crowds and some that have just little bitty, bitty crowds. 
some that are all white, some that have been all black, some that have been all brown, and some that have been every color that you can ever imagine. Kind of like the song that Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, pink and green, strangest kids you've ever seen. You know, uh, some, some of those, some that are very stately, and some that are in some of those third world countries where when it comes time to feed the babies, they just unembarrassedly feed the babies. Uh, you might have to ask me about that after church is over what I'm talking about. But in all of these, they are still God's church. And yeah. Jesus loves the church. He died for the church. Yeah. And Paul said this about the church. He said, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jesus called the church a glorious church. And so when one says glorious, what comes to mind? To many it means big, big church. Big budgets, big buildings, big parking lots, lots of people. Others think it talks about music where you got everything from Bach to rock. Others think wardrobe styles, where you come in and you got to have you know, a shirt and a tie and a coat. Others think it's talking about golf shirts and skinny jeans. Others think worship styles. Got to be traditional. Got to sing out of the hymn book. Can't have screens. Others think about contemporary you know, where it's some of that 7-Eleven music, you know, seven words, sing it 11 times over and over and over, you know. Some think about where it's blended, and that's where two groups are mad at you, the old group that where you didn't sing enough of the old songs and the new group where you didn't sing enough of the new songs. Some churches have everything from holy laughter to holy crying, but the church that Jesus built, the glorious church, <laughs> That's a model. That's for every size and every style. And it's found in the book of Acts. And I'm going to read the text and then I'm going to make a few comments. <coughs> and maybe by 1.30 we're going to be out of here. And we can go on and eat somewhere. So I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 40, through verse number 47, I like the words are there on the screen, in living in yellow color. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as everyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Then again, just over a page, Acts chapter 4, verse 31 through 35. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each anyone as anyone had. Father, thank you. Lord, it's so good to be at liberty. God, I love this church, and Lord, I know that you love it even more. You said you love the church and gave yourself for it. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that in my estimation, Lord, you could call this a glorious church. And so, Father, I want to look to see today from the book of Acts what it takes to be a glorious church in your sight. And Father, that we might see what it might be like to be a glorious saint in your sight. And so Lord, that we might just so order our lives and construct our lives. Lord, that we might be pleasing to you as a member of the church. And we'll praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 When you look at this passage of Scripture, one of the first things you noticed about the glorious church was that it was endued with power. You notice in chapter 4, verse number 33, the Bible says that this church was with great power. The apostles gave witness of the resurrection. And Luke chapter 24, verse number 49 it said, Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. We understand that the church operates on power. Jesus said that he was going to endue the church with power, but we sometimes have understanding of what it means to be endued with power and how that comes about. To be endued with power, it means that we just are going to be clothed with or we're going to put on that power as a garment. We understand its meaning, but what is the methodology? How do we get that power or how do we have that power? We have to understand that it is predicated on four different things. First of all, it is predicated upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you tarry in Jerusalem, or you wait in Jerusalem, and I'm going to send the promise of the Father upon you, and you're going to be endued with that power that comes from on high, and that power is the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them in the book of Acts, in the very first chapter, in verse number 8, he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Jesus said in, in the Gospels, he said, without me you can do nothing. We understand that if we are going to be able to do anything for God, that we're going to have to do it through the work of the Holy Spirit. If we do not do that, then we're left to just promotions and productions and personalities and the powerless schemes of marketing that so many churches are trying to get accomplished the things of God through doing these things today. Right. You understand that when we look at what is happening across America today, in those instances where in college campuses today that there is just those instantaneous, remarkable experiences of the Holy Spirit where on college campuses that kids are just getting together under the power of the Holy Spirit and God is just moving in like a fresh wind and a fresh fire and breathing upon those young kids and revival is taking place. Amen. There is no productions, there are no promotions, there are no procedures that are being followed. In fact, at Asbury, they are 
got through with chapel and they were being dismissed and someone started playing something on the instruments. It's called a post lead, if, post lead if you're in one of those eyebrow churches. And the power of God just moved through. No fog machines, no lights, no nothing. And, and, and the kids just started worshiping the Lord. They didn't get up and go to class. And, and it just instantaneously broke out. I was a part of one of those revivals. I got saved on November the 10th of 1968. Right after that, our pastor had his tonsils taken out. It's all right for little kids to have that done, but as an adult, it's a horrible thing to have done. And he preached that morning. He came back that night, and in the hoarse voice, he said, I'm not able to preach. And he said, does anybody have anything to say? And we all sat there looking on at it like a cat looking at a new gate. <laughs> and he was fixing to dismiss people to let us go home. And a lady stood up and said, I'd like to sing a song. And she sang a song and the Spirit of God just kind of ushered in on that place. And people started coming to the altar and, and, and weeping and praying before the Lord. And... and the preacher got with the deacons and said, I think we ought to come back tomorrow night. And, and so they decided, hey, let's come back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And they, they, they left. And, and, and as I was leaving, the preacher said to me, he said, Brother John, would you give your testimony tomorrow night? And I said, I'll be glad to do that if you'll tell me what it is. <laughs> <laughs> because I'd only been saved for a few weeks. And when I got saved, I did not know that there was an Old and a New Testament in the Bible. That's how green I was. I really did not know anything about the Word of God. And he said, just tell the events that, that led up to your getting saved. And I said, I'll be glad to. We came on Monday night at 7 o'clock. The house was just full of folks. And I got up and I told them how I got saved. And there was a lady sitting back back where you are now. And she stood up and she said, that has never happened to me before. And I said, if you'll come down here, I'll tell you how it can happen to you. And I got to lead my first person to the Lord. Amen. Not only did she come, but there were other people that just got up and started coming. And that revival went on all week long. Nobody preached. We did not have a guest preacher. We did not have anyone preach. People just gave their testimonies or sang a song or something. And that's how it started. You understand, without the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Right, yes. We're just absent and we're just devoid of the power Amen. of God without the Holy Spirit. You understand, we have to have the Holy Spirit. But yes. secondly, the Bible says we have to have the proclamation of the Savior. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse number 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You understand that, that, that the, the gospel of Christ is the power of God. You can do a lot of things. But unless there is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're never going to see any person ever get saved or come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says in the first Corinthians chapter one, verse number 18, for the message of the cross, so the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to but the, us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Now you understand that the centrality of all that we are doing, it is the, the message or the preaching of the cross. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. If you go into some churches, you're going to notice that they have what is known as a split chancel. Over here they have a pulpit and over here they have a pulpit. One is for the reading of the word and the other is the preaching of the word. But you'll notice if you'll go into the Baptist churches, you'll notice the pulpit is in the center of the church because they believe that the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
It's the centrality of what we do. It is the message of the cross that is the power of God. Amen. Amen. You understand that there is a lot of good things that go on in this world. And there are a lot of great things that go on in this world. But the greatest thing, the power of God for getting people into the kingdom is the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the preaching of the cross. Yeah. The third thing that happens to be endued with power is the purity of the saints. And I'm going to quit preaching here and go to meddling just a little bit if I can. Because you understand that power is predicated upon purity. You cannot run with the devil and walk with the Lord. Yeah. A person who is the saint of God cannot spend his time watching TV with it fussing and cussing and have the mind of Christ. Yeah. You cannot feed your soul six days a week and then come in on the seventh day and, and try to have the power of Christ. When you lose yeah. your purity, you're going to lose your power. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. You understand that, that people who laden their lives with sin have lost their power with God. It is like Samson getting his hair cut. Yeah, right. You realize that his power was gone. And the Bible says in the King James, he wished it not or he knew it not that his power was all gone with God. We have people wondering why in the world do they not have power in our churches anymore? It's because that they don't stand for anything and they fail for everything. Yeah. That they got so much of the world inside of them that they've lost their power with God. Yeah. And they don't see anything happen in their churches anymore and they're wondering why. It is because it is like it was in the days of Joshua that Achan has coveted the, 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 the Babylonian garments and, and, and the, 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 the gold that, that is there and, and they've lost their power with God and God is not there anymore. And we need to clean up ourselves and we need to clean up our churches and we need to get back to the things of God. Amen. And the fourth thing is that there is the prayer of the servants. You notice that that church, the early church, was busy praying. And where much prayer is focused, much power falls. The only thing that is outside the reach of prayer are those things that are outside the will of God. Amen. The Bible says that when they prayed, the place was shaken. And an old preacher said, and when you play, the place is taken. You understand that our power <coughs> is predicated upon the fact that, that we are praying people and that we pray for God to do wondrous works <coughs> and that where much prayer is focused, that much power falls and that we must be a praying church right. before yeah. we ever become a powerful church. Church. Yeah. So you understand that the very first thing for us to do to be a glorious church is we must be endued with power. Right. Yeah. But the second thing that you notice about the glorious church in the book of Acts, the Bible says that there was an equality of persons. They are one heart and one soul. That's what it says in verse number 32. And when you think about this, you have to notice the composition of the makeup of the early New Testament church. You understand that back during the 60s that there was this great thing that went on uh, about the revolution that, that, that came uh, 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 about, about the blacks and, and, and the whites, especially here in, in, in the deep south. The great movement of, uh, of the integration. The shameful thing about it is that, that it started and it started outside of the church. It should have been a movement that started on the inside of the church. With bless its heart, it started outside of the church and it was slow 
to make its way on the inside side of the church. It's made its way uh, in, into the church that, that, that I was pastoring when I had received an invitation to go to Nigeria to preach the gospel. And I mentioned it to our church, and our church says that we're a, we're a segregated church. Black people will never be a member of our church. And I said, how can you have that in your constitution? And I fought that. And what that got me was another church to pastor. Mm -hmm. Right. They didn't fire me. I got to quit before they did that. Right. But you understand that that was a, a, a racial issue back in back in those those days. I actually in that congregation had uh, card carrying Ku Klux Klan members in that church. And what amazed me was that they claimed to be Christians, but they claimed to hate Jews. Yeah. Now it's quite hard to kind of hard to, to be a Christian and, and, and hate Jews because Jesus was a Jew. Yeah. And, you know that always amazed me. That and, and I posed that to one of those card carrying members, and he said that don't count. And I said I'm afraid it does. <laughs> you know, but 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 anyway, uh, it, it it is one of those things that when you look at the New Testament church and you see the amazing composition that God had had for the church and the makeup of his church that they're one heart and one soul and I told, told them that, that, that when you start picking out uh, who you want to join the church God just may not let you have anybody exactly. and, and that church that I was pastoring where we were running over 400 in worship service now will really push it to have 80 in, in, in church now but that's neither here nor there. God's taking care of all that. But but listen to what, what Jesus did uh, with, with his disciples. There were 12 disciples Jesus called to help him. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Thaddeus, Judas, and Bartholomew. Two of those that he had in there, one of those was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. That, that just seems a simple statement to make uh, a statement that he was a tax collector. He, he was actually a, 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 a part of, of the Jewish mafia of that day that he had aligned with the Roman government and said that I'll be a tax collector or a tribute collector, which means that Israel will have to pay you the Roman government X number of dollars to keep you from coming and beating the snot out of them uh, for not doing that. And I'll, I'll collect the taxes for you and uh, I'll align with you the Roman government. And the Roman government said, well, if you do that, you take, collect this much taxes for you. And while you're collecting the taxes, you can go ahead and collect some taxes for yourself. Yeah. Uh, for your wages. So you can levy taxes on them. And of course they did. And that's what Jesus meant when he said they put burdens on you grievous to be born. They were very rich people. They were like Zacchaeus in the Bible. Uh, and then there was Simon the Zealot. Simon a Zealot was, was a person who hated the Roman government or any person who had aligned with the Roman government. People like Matthew. And they had taken an oath in blood that if they had opportunity, they would kill them. And so Jesus just put the two together and called them apostles. Mm -hmm. And had those together. And I thought, that's kind of interesting to have those two in the church. And then there were not only the disciples that Jesus had, but there were the friends that Paul had and, and that he greeted at the end of the book of Romans, those that, that, that he had with him. In Romans 16, 21, he wrote and he said, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, 
Sopater, my fellow country, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my fellow host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you, and Quartus, a brother. Now that seems simple enough. There was Timothy. We know who Timothy was. Paul writes to him. And there was Luke, and there was Jason, and so Peter. And then there was this guy named Tertius who was writing this epistle. Then Gaius, who is the host, who is the guy that has a house that's big enough for the church to gather there, who greets you. And the rest is who is the treasurer of the city. So we've got a couple of rich guys who are there. Timothy is there, who is a preacher. And then Luke and Jason and so Peter, we don't know. And then there's this guy named Tertius, and then there's this guy named Quartus. Now, I know that many of you are probably not familiar with Latin, but Tertius and Quartus. Tertius means three, and Quartus means four. That's where we get Quartus, it's where we get our word quarter from. That's a fourth of a dollar. Just four. So, so we got the two rich guys. We, we, we got Gaius, and, and, and then we got Erastus, the rich guys, and then we got three and four. <laughs> They're just slaves. And then we got Timothy, who is there as Paul's son in the faith. And they're all together in the church. And that's the makeup of the church of that day. The majority of the New Testament church were slaves. Yeah. Or they were relatively poor people. So Paul has taken all of these and he says, now, now we're here in the church and we all greet you. And we're all the same people. But we've noticed that sometimes birds of a feather seem to flock together in our churches that we have today. When I was saved, I asked God for something that I could do. All I knew after I got saved was to read this book and to pray. And then we decided <coughs> that we could have a bus ministry. And I said, God, I can drive a bus if you'll let me drive a bus. So we got a 40-passenger bus, and I let it known among the kids. I said, I'm going to have a bus, and I'm going to drive a bus. First night I drove a bus during revival, I brought 60 kids in on a 40-passenger bus. <laughs> Some of them had to tell me where the kids lived so I could take them home. It was just a miracle of God. We ran 150 on Sunday morning, we run 200 on Sunday night, and we run 300 on Wednesday night. I mean, we got kids from everywhere. And then a remark was made to me, we don't want those kind in our church. I mean, if you can imagine having 200 kids, and then some of them, We'd go into their house and you'd see a can in the fireplace. And they'd take that can out and they'd open it and they'd dump it out and that's what the kid would eat. They wouldn't heat it on the stove or heat it in the can. Those poor little kids, and some of them, bless their heart, first time they'd ever heard the gospel, first time they'd ever knew anything about church. They were they were the most undisciplined thing. One of them get go get up to go to the bathroom and twenty of them would get up and go to the bathroom. I mean it was and, and boy it, it, it was a, it was a disruption like you never seen until we started children's church. But this guy said we don't want that kind in our church. And God must have heard him. Because there's not a church there anymore. Because when you tell God what kind you want in the church, you may not have a church at all. Right. Because them kind of people is the ones that Jesus died for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And when they get saved, them's the kind of people that Jesus lives for. Yeah. So we need to do our business to find that there is an equality of persons in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. The old preacher Dwight L. Moody of the past century looked at a guy that was laying there in the gutter and all the people were walking around him and Dwight L. Moody went over there to him and started ministering to him. He looked at the guy that was the pastor buddy of his and he said, except for the grace of God, they're the wise. These are the ones that Jesus loves and these are the ones that should make up our church. Amen. When Jesus was speaking and he gave a great kingdom and a bunch of folks started making an excuse, Jesus said, listen, you go out into the highways and the hedges and you compel people to come into my house and eat my food and enjoy me and my kingdom because he wanted them to come and to be a part of his family. Amen. There was an equality of persons. Thirdly, they were enlightened about possessions and glorious church. They're endued with power. They're in equality about persons and they're enlightened about possessions. The Bible says they had all things common. They sold land and possessions and gave it to the church. He said, well, he's going to talk about money now. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Love to talk about money. I'm very secure when it comes to talk about money. We talk first about tithing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse number 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, or you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, <coughs> and neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Most of us in here know about the Pharisees. Jesus just called them hypocrites. That's how you make friends and influence people. <laughs> <laughs> they lost as a ball in high weeds and they're just as empty as last year's bird nest. The yeah. spiritual leaders of that place and Jesus said they're like sepulchers. They're just full of dead men's bones. And that the woes that he pronounced upon his people, he, in this instance he called them hypocrites. He said they're as religious as they could be because they tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Little bitty things. Anise is, is, is licorice if you want to know what it smells like. They tithe of little bitty seed. Jesus said, you ought to have done this. <coughs> These people that Jesus knew was as lost, as lost as they could be. He says, you ought to tithe. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Yeah. It belongs to Him. <coughs> In the book of Malachi, He called them a bunch of robbers and thieves. He said, how, how, do, how, how do you call us robbers? He said, because you're robbing God. Can you imagine a man robbing God? Yeah. I can imagine the Apostle Paul on the day that he got saved. When the Apostle Paul got saved and he experienced that thing on the road to Damascus when God came and God came brighter than the light of the sun and he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he realized that it, it was the living Lord that he had been persecuting there in the church. And Paul finally got saved. And he got up from there and he said, well, bless God, I'm under grace now. I don't have to die. Can you imagine someone like that? Mm -hmm. Listen, Paul became one who gave everything that he had unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And he experienced that thing that, that only saved people experience in God's grace. Jesus was there at a temple one time and people were coming by and there were big things that like, like tulip flower, trumpet flowers that had where people would come by and they'd throw their money in there 
and, and, and you listen to it jingle jangle as it went down into the treasury. And there was a poor widow that came that had two little bitty coins and she threw them in there that were called mites in that day. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, that woman has given more than all of these others put together because she has given all of her living. Right. She's given everything that she's got. She's given her life in those two little coins. We understand that, that giving is, is, is a part of the life of Christianity right. life. Yeah. Not only in tithing, but in stewardship. We understand that Jesus owns it all anyway, and he just allows us to, to, to manage it. There was a guy by the name of R.G. Letourneau. Some of you may have heard of him. R.G. Letourneau was a great businessman. R.G. Letourneau, if, if you know anything about heavy equipment, everything that has a track on it, a bulldozer, a, 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 a backhoe, any, anything like that, a track loader, R.G. Letourneau had, had a part in that. He owned it, he operated it, he did that. R.G. Letourneau went around and, and he preached to men and he said, men, here is the thing I want you to do. I want you to start tithing 10% on your income, on your, the gross amount you have. I'm going to be back in a year and if you've suffered any loss because you are a tither, and you've tithed, I'm going to pay you back. And people knew that R.G. Letourneau would do that. And he would come back in a year, and never did he have to pay anyone anything because they had given unto the Lord. And, and R.G. Letourneau would then say, if you can trust me for a year, can't you trust God even more than that? Amen. Yeah. And R.G. Letourneau, a multi-millionaire, gave 90% of what God allowed him to have, and he lived off of the 10%. Amen. God would let him have. Amen. Listen, if we, we could trust a man and his word to provide for us, can we, can we not trust God? Several years ago, when my grandson, this is ancient history now, he's 30 years old now, was about three years old. We were carrying him home after keeping him for a weekend. He wanted a Happy Meal. We stopped at McDonald's. I got him a Happy Meal, got him a drink, got him a toy, got him some fries, got him a burger and that. And after he opened it and he was fixing to eat, I reached over there and I got him a French fry. Lord, you, you, you would have thought that I'd have shot his dog. <laughs> Or, or, or I'd run over his mother or something. He'd never seen the waterworks coming out of his eyes and the tears. And he Papa, you got a French fry. He'd done all of this. But he forgot three very important things. The first one is I had just got through blessing him with a hamburger, with French fries, and a Coke and a toy. It cost him nothing. Secondly, of all of the things that he had before him, I took one French fry and only one. And the third thing was I was big enough that I could have took every bit of it if I wanted. <laughs> and folks, that's stewardship. God's blessed us with everything that we have, everything Amen. that we've got, everything that we own. Amen. And all that it requires just 10%. And he said, I'll let you be stewardship over the rest of it. And we forget that God owns it all. Amen. Right. And God needs none of it. Right. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. God can get along real well without us. Yeah. Yeah. I was good in the insurance business before the Lord called me to preach. I just went from insurance to insurance when I went to preaching. And sometimes I'd get a little cocky with that with guys around the office and a fellow one time said, John, if you think you're getting this in this business, you go down to the ocean and dip up a bucket of water and see how long it'll take that hole to fill up. 
Listen, God wouldn't miss me a bit if he snatched me up right now. The world would just keep running quick and along. Sun will come up tomorrow morning and just keep on going. God doesn't need me in this business. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need my time. He doesn't need my talent. He doesn't need my treasures. But I sure do need him. I'm dependent on, on him. And so I get in life and about my possessions. I know they belong to him. I know where they come from. So they early church, they realized that. And if they had possessions, then they sold it to make sure that everybody had enough. And then we're going to close with this last thing. They were not only enlightened about possessions, they were evangelistic in priority. In verse number 33, the Bible says that with great power they witnessed about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There was a priority of proclamation about the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he had done in their heart. Good things sometimes can crowd out the great things that takes place in local churches. Sometimes we get so busy with church work that we forget about the work of the church yeah. and the great commission that God has called us to do. Statistics tell us that 90% of the people who claim to be Christians, who profess to be Christians, have never won anyone to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the majority of those that did, did it within the first three months that they were saved. I went to an evangelistic crusade where Charles Stanley was preaching. He was preaching to 1,500 pastors at Evangelistic Conference at Shades Mountain Baptist Church. I remember that day very well because when he summed up his, his message, he said, Guys, preachers, I want to ask you two questions. First of all, when was the last time you won anyone to Jesus? In that group of men at Shades Mountain Baptist Church, you could have heard a pin drop. And then he said, I want to ask you another question. Men, when was the last time that you tried? I was fortunate enough because on that way, that morning I needed to stop from gas. And there was a guy that came up to me and I got to share Christ with him. But among that group, of 1,500 people. There were people all over that building who could not honestly say that they remembered the last time they tried to win anybody. Preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ who never tried. If I had my ministry to do all over again, I believe I'd spend more time training folks how to be Great Commission Christians, how to reach people for the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. Why? Because of the priority of proclamation and the product of proclamation. Yeah. The Lord added to the church daily Right. those who were being saved. Saved is one of the best words in all of the Bible. It's a biblical word. It's a good word because of its imagery. Saved is the imagery of people that are in a burning building and that you rush in <coughs> to rescue those people. Saved is a word whose imagery is that you see people that are drowning and that they're going down for the last time and that you reach in and that you pull them up and that you rescue them from that awful fate. On November the 10th of 1968, I prayed three words. 
I said, Lord, save me. That's the only prayer that I knew. I'd never heard a prayer prayed in my home that I remember. I never heard a prayer prayed around meal time. I'd never heard a prayer prayed during times of emergencies or sicknesses. My mother was a, a, a Catholic. My daddy was a nothing. And we just didn't do that. We never went to church. Only thing I knew that I was lost and I needed to be rescued from my sins and I just knelt at an altar and I said, Lord, save me. Praise God. And God added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. And I became a part of a glorious church. Amen. Amen. I became a part of something glorious. And you may be here this morning. And here is how you can be a part of something glorious. If you're not saved, you can get up, walk down this aisle and say, Brother John, I want to be saved. You can just say a little simple prayer and become a part of a glorious church. If you're here and your church membership is somewhere else, <coughs> You can say, I want to be a part of the local church, and you'll be a part of something glorious. Amen. You may never have surrendered to baptism, and you can say, I want to be baptized, and you can be baptized and be a part of something glorious. It's something glorious because it's his church. Amen. It's the church that Jesus loved. It's the church Amen. that he died for. It's the church that he founded. I will build my church, he said, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. You may be here and your church letter is somewhere else. You can bring your letter, your love, your life, and you can go to work for Jesus right here. And you'll be a part of something glorious. Right. And you can say, Brother John, I'm already a member here then praise God. You're a part of something that's glorious. Mm -hmm. Amen. You're a member of God's church and God's family. Father, thank you. But Lord, what you've done is glorious. You've loved the church and you've given yourself for it, that you might present her to yourself as a glorious church without spot or without wrinkle. Lord, you've loved the church. You've died for it. You've given yourself for it. That you might present it to yourself. Lord, we want to be presentable to you. Lord, we don't want to have any spots, any flaws in our character, our conduct. Lord, if there's any in our lives, Lord, would you show it to us right now? Lord, we'll get that right straight with you. Lord, if there's something amiss or something wrong betwixt us, Lord, we need to mend the fence. Lord, we can do that right now. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, they can take care of that now. Lord, they can just walk down the aisle that's closest to them, and Lord, we can teach them how that they can just open their heart, their life, and receive Jesus as their Savior. Lord, if they need to rededicate that life, if they need to join the church or follow Jesus in baptism, Lord, they can be a part of something that's glorious today. Thank you, Lord, for your church and how that we can be a part of it. Lord, work your will, work your way in hearts and lives today. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you stand and let's just sing an afternoon of invitation and if the Lord blesses you, if you need to do something today, you do that and we'll give Jesus the praise for it for we ask it in his name. Amen.